Hello, everyone, and welcome to HIV 2020, Where Are We Now? Today, we will be talking about what it's like to maneuver HIV and AIDS healthcare in developing countries like Sierra Leone. We'll focus on how cultural and economic challenges weigh heavily on HIV prevention and treatment, as well as the continuous stride towards strengthening Sierra Leone's healthcare system. Ultimately, we'll discuss how access to reliable health services makes a big, big difference. I'm Alexa Rocourt, a media and events coordinator at QBI, an organized research unit within the School of Pharmacy. And today we have with us a very exceptional and talented guest, Mohamed Bailer-Berry from Sierra Leone, which is a country on the West Coast in Africa, who will, who will share firsthand accounts of what it's like to work towards combating HIV in his home country. It's my honor to lead this conversation with Byler because he is really a true driver of change. Before I turn it over to Byler, I want to welcome you, our viewers, to get involved in this conversation by asking questions at any time using the live comment section on YouTube or Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. So hi, Byler. Uh, it's great to have you here. Hi. Good. Yeah. So to start, oh, I want yeah. our Good, good. To start, I sort of want our audience to get to know you a bit. So for those who don't know, can you tell us a bit about your background and what originally inspired you to become a researcher and a clinician? So I am a clinician from Sierra Leone and I went to medical school in Sierra Leone, struggled through medical school. And when I graduated, actually one incident made the change. So um, I was working in the government hospital at the pediatric ward they brought a child that was very sick. But then in Sierra Leone, you have to pay a consultation, you have to pay everything before you see the doctor. So I saw this kid and I sh he had malaria, I prescribed this malaria pills and gave the mom and said, go buy this pill. Expect the mom to have the money to go buy the pills. Three days later, this mom brought this kid again to the hospital. Now convulsing with very severe malaria. And I recognized this mom and I said, why, why, what's wrong with the kids? She said, I did not have the money to buy the medication. And that really shocked me and I was like, okay, if I, not collect, if I had not collected the consultation fee from this mom or did all this to pay the test or whatever, this mom would have gotten the money to buy the pills. But instead, so then I realized the failure of the system to, to the failure of the healthcare system to people in Sierra Leone. So this, what can I do to help change the system? What can I do to help this program? And then one in, in one year, one American doctor came to Sierra Leone, Dr. Dan Kelly, and wanted to start an organization. And we started, we, we, we thought about like helping the amputated civilians during the war because they were all abandoned, like just um, NGOs parachuted, give them um, some few aid and left. And then um, Dan and I, thought about like, okay, how can we support people in terms of health? Because we are doctors, both of us are clinicians. We need to work for the long term sustainably. So we decided to start Well Body Alliance, a clinic. But we started it in Connor because like during the war, Connor was the epicenter of the war and the Diamond Rich District. And I've never been there. So we do we took a tour around the country when we went to Connor. I was struck by the devastation. I was struck by the, the, the dysfunctional health system in Kono. So we started in Kono to support the amputated civilian. But then the clinic, in three months, I realized that there is no healthcare system in Kono. And like um, the healthcare system is completely dysfunctional. The hospitals are empty and people are not going to the hospital. People are traveling miles to access a Catholic hospital in the north. And so we built Well Body Clinic in 2008 and opened it and started adding programs as we progressed. And we added a HIV TB program when we realized that uh, one day I was going to the homes of, of patients and I saw this patient that was TB, TB and HIV. And I was struck by his condition and he would not go to the facility because if he comes, they will either ask him for money or he doesn't have the money to pay to come to the facility. So I started a, a community-based program because I have read about um, partners in health work in Haiti and Rwanda through the book uh, Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kida. So I reached out to partners in health. 
and I asked, I reached out to Paul, Dr. Paul Farmer and asked, like, we want to replicate your program for Haiti, and like, how would you help? So that's how our, our relationship with partners have started. They supported us, like, with all the materials to train the first cohort of community health workers in Kono, and we started tracing uh, patients and doing sensors trying to to get patients and then I got very interested in HIV and TB and like wanted to do research to know how those programs, operations research, how these programs are impacting the lives of HIV patients and TB patients, how those programs will be now supporting HIV. So that's what how I started and getting involved in, in, in both the, 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 the clinic, founding the clinic and then uh, working on, on research on HIV TB research. It's truly, it's really, truly remarkable how you how you've gone from starting with amputees to becoming a very, you know, very primary care clinic for not only HIV but TV. I know you do programs in maternal health and child health, so that's that's excellent. Um, I want us to talk about how living and dealing with HIV and AIDS in developing countries is a very different experience than that of a developed country. In the in the U.S., for example, I get the sense that it has taken a lot of work over the last 50 years to confront taboos and stigmas related to AIDS, but that reducing this kind of discrimination can be very effective in getting people who are living with HIV to be more open about seeking help and treatment and even having healthier relationships. So do you feel that shame is still a big part of living with HIV in Sierra Leone? And if so, does it impact the number of people visiting your clinic, for example? You know, how does it generally uh, affect it? And how does World Body Clinic help address these issues? So absolutely, um, I see the numbers. I read about the numbers, how HIV is dropping, the prevalence of HIV is dropping in the world. and like. But those numbers are basically uh, talking about the developed world. And when you go to come to Australia, naturally the prevalence of HIV is rising, not decreasing, stigma is increasing, not decreasing, because of firstly the access to, to treatment. Patients, when patients get sick and they're very sick, they got stigmatized because like people would frown at them. People would say, oh, this person had HIV, look at his body, look at all, all his conditions. So he, the patient himself would have self-stigma and also the people would, would stigmatize and discriminate him. And uh, we saw that firsthand in corner and, and, and at our clinic. And then we started, we decided to think about why, why are people not coming to the clinic? Why are HIV patients not coming to the clinic? And it's all boil out to poverty and, 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 and lack of resources. They don't have money to pay to come to the facility to collect their drugs. They don't have money to, to get food on their table. And they don't have uh, 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 the resources to help them get the care that they require. And so we started a program recently calling uh, giving cash transfer to HIV patients with low viral load and low low adherence and that's actually to me I, I would say very success even though it's not like novel is not new they've been done in other countries that have been proven to succeed in, in other countries and the global fund in fact was supporting uh, food support to patients but they stopped it and it's 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 weird that we know that this is success this is helping patients around the world and helping patients in Africa but because it's not well um, invented in Sierra Leone, it did not show any any success, so they, they stopped it. So we're doing this, this, this cash transfer to patients and doing an operations research to actually show to the Global Fund that it can be done and done well and successful. Like, for example, we have a classic a classic example of a patient, Fanta, Fanta Koma, from, one, from our program, who, since we have community health worker program that are linked to patients, they follow them to give, make sure that they take their medication. But without food, the patient will refuse to take their medications. Without food or transport, they will refuse to come to the facility. So we added that component and patients are coming. And like this, Fanta Koroma is a sexual health worker and she got HIV. She had a boyfriend and had a child with the boyfriend. The boyfriend found out that she's HIV positive and the boyfriend abandoned her and took the child away and abandoned her. She was really, she was really, really down. Her BMI was below 16, 16. Uh, and like uh, viral load is very, very high. 
and we enrolled her into this program, gave her cash transfer. In three months, she started improving, gaining weight, and like before she graduated the program, she developed about gained about fifteen pounds of. 15 to 20 pounds of weight. And also with the cash transfer, she was able to start a business, as you can see from the photo, to help sustain herself. So now she's doing the business, selling slippers and getting profit to, to, to like um, um, sustain herself. And now she told us that like, look, now I'm not stigmatized. Now I'm not afraid to say that I have HIV because I'm, I, I'm better than even the people that don't have HIV. I'm, 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 I'm healthy, I'm working around, I'm doing my business. So why should I be ashamed? I, so she proudly says that she's, she's now a champion in our, in our program. She speaks about being HIV positive, being successful because she had to her medication. That's just an example of showing how um, lack of resources and lack of um, uh, support to HIV patients cause stigma. She would have died. She would have been in a house, not coming to the facility, not taking her drug because she don't have the resources. And now she's proud to say that she's HIV positive and, and she's no more stigmatized. So stigma is actually tied to, to, to I mean, poverty and like lack of resources and, 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 and all the stuff. That's really, really incredible. And, you know, if I'm, if I'm gathering this correctly, it sounds like factors, you know, such as low income, mismanagement of resources, food insecurity generally affect HIV healthcare. And so things like employment or um, ownership of assets and generally opportunities to financial independence can empower patients and especially women uh, as they manage their families and even relationships with men. So that's pretty incredible. Uh, and I know that part of, you know, the cash transfer program is that you have health workers who track their process, right? Can you tell us a bit about why that's important for, for medical care workers to understand the real needs of families? Why did you guys implement this extra step? So we learned that um, patients stay home. They don't come to the facilities because they're very sick or they don't have resources to come to access the facility. And uh, after reading uh, Mountains Beyond Mountains, I found, I learned what Paul Farmer started in Haiti and also in Rwanda and like got training a, a cohort of community health workers to follow patients, sometimes take the drugs to them, to their homes, ensure that they take their drugs and educate them about HIV, about TB, about stigma. and. Uh, so we thought that program was great and we replicated it in Kono. And now that HIV program is being replicated across the country. The government went and evaluated our program in Kono and find out Kono doesn't have any bedridden, any bedridden HIV patients. And they asked us to help them um, organize a program. Before I started my PhD, that's what I was working on, helping the government to scale up the community the health worker program across the country on TB and HIV. And then, like, it's successful because like that brings patients to the facility, that brings uh, patients to care and link patients and retain them in care. And also, we also have a, another cater of community health workers, that is traditional bath attendance that we started because of bringing pregnant women to the facility. And we also work in the facility. And that came about one night I was at the clinic and I walked, I was walking home. I had women singing. And I was, I was wondering, why are they singing at the time of the night? So I went there and I met women around the woman who is pregnant laying in the middle of the sitting room. And like women are sitting around on the floor singing. And like I was struck and I was like, why? Why is this? So the next day I came to the woman and asked her, like, why don't you to the, go to the hospital? You decide to stay here and deliver at home that is on steroid. He said, look, you know that singing that these women were singing for me? The, the comfort that songs are give, is giving me is not, I, I will not receive that with any medication, any pain medication in the hospital. That kept me thinking like, okay, what would I do about that? So then when we built our maternal center, in Kono, we hire traditional bath attendants to walk there to provide the singing, just like in this photo, those two women standing there, traditional bath attendants, when a woman comes, she's in labor, they will sing to her these melodious songs and make the woman comfortable while she's delivering in a sterile, in a sterile uh, environment. And, and since we opened the clinic in 2014, we did not have any maternal debt to this point. And that's like unheard of in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. And like, 
And it's not magic. It's just that we're providing the care that the woman receives. And, and now we're having an average of about 40 deliveries a month at the clinic. And it's just amazing how that clinic has grown. Like when we opened the clinic, we were seeing like um, 10, 15, 20, 50 patients a day. The maximum would see 60, 70. Now we're seeing 250 patients a day at the clinic every day. And when we started the clinic, we were doing paper-based, like you can see all these women having their papers, these their chats. And now with partners in health, with the resources, now we've transformed the clinic into completely like complete electronic medical records that is all in all departments. And I mean, when I went to Saloon, the last time I went to the clinic, it was amazing when I saw this room is now no more, it's not existing anymore because like we don't need people charts, we're doing electronic records. So, which is amazing how it's grown. And also we built a bath waiting home for women like that living far in, in remote areas that it's difficult for them when they're pregnant to get to access the clinic or whatever, for them to come when they are like two weeks due or three weeks due, they stay in the bath waiting home and they receive three course meals and they receive screening and they, they will monitor until they get to labor and they deliver. I think all those factors added is responsible for not having an eternal death at that clinic to this point. Mm -hmm. You know, from what you're seeing, it's really evident that progress is made possible by improved at access to healthcare services. It impacts all sorts of different aspects in someone's life. That's pretty remarkable that you guys tap into different factors of health. And that sort of leads me to my question. I wanted to ask you about some other pandemics or, or um, viruses that you've worked with. I know that you've been very involved with Ebola at some point um, in your country. And that will lead me to the next audience question that we have that we can address next. But first, tell us a bit about your work with with Ebola. Yeah, so um, doing Ebola, actually, I would say, I'm proud to say that our clinic was the only clinic open in the country throughout the Ebola. It's never shut its door. And it was caring for patients that are not Ebola because we trained and we have Dr. Dan Kelly came out. We trained all of us, all the health, all our workers on, on, on IPC and everything. And they were very careful. And we did not have any of our staff got infected. And uh, that also lead, lead us to, to talk about the experience doing Ebola is helping Sierra Leone to tackle this COVID. Like COVID is ravaging the world, but in Sierra Leone, we still have about, we only have throughout, we have about 2,045 2, confirmed cases to this point and like 74 deaths. That's amazing because like doing Ebola, we build structures that would handle the pandemic and they're doing it. The government is doing it. I was in Sierra Leone in February, in February to September. I helped the government with the with the with the surveillance and, and, and contact tracing in the country. And like it's working. It's like amazing. Sometimes I sit in America and look at the TV and see what's happening in America and what's happening in other in other parts of the world. And I think about Sierra Leone, poor Sierra Leone and what is happening there. It's amazing to me, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, as you can see, we have an audience question that relates to this that you sort of addressed. But Nevin says, hi, Byler, nice shirt. Can you please speak about how COVID-19 is impacting Sierra Leone? And it seems like it's not as problematic there compared to other parts of the world. What are your comments on that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm still wondering why, although like I can assume that this, the system where we're where in place doing Ebola, doing the experience of Ebola, we built an emergency center. We did the, 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 the COVID immediately activity uh, center immediately and shot the, shot the airport. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, in program and like, uh, and, and, and the COVID, I think it's we're limited a little bit in resources, but still we're trying to do with what we are, we're trying to do what we are doing right now to help the country to, 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 to uh, I mean, and Sierra Leone is among the four countries in the world that is, that is uh, declared less risk to live right now in the world. Imagine Sierra, small Sierra Leone. 
And I think it's because of the experience of Ebola and the things that we did during Ebola and remained them and activated all of them during COVID. I think that's responsible for why COVID is not a big problem right now in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. But we have another audience question by Prosper. He says, how are the educational institutions and local leaders, chiefs and teachers helping spread the empowerment of HIV patients and citizens? In so um, the HIV program, actually um, with our program, we move, we went to all the communities and talked to all the chiefs about this program and, uh, and, and still getting, I mean, also getting cognizant of of the the the, the 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 stigma associated with HIV, mm -hmm. we made sure that they, they don't identify patients that are HIV, but like also talk to them about how they can help get stigma away, how they can use their powers or whatever to make sure stigma is not is not is not very prevalent in the country or in their communities. And they are also supporting, like for example, if someone stigmatizes a patient or whatever, they can go to the chief and the chief will take it seriously as before where they will be there, but now they're taking it seriously and, and mitigating the person that stigmatized the patient. And the patients are getting satisfied with that. And it's it's just that like right now what we're working on in this even in this current uh, global fund grant we are we added in, 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 in including HIV, a HIV curriculum in the medical school and in even high school curriculum to teach about HIV prevention, HIV, because like most times here, they do social mobilization through radios, through uh, uh, speaking on, on microphones and all those, but like, it's not impacting the the, 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 the stigma and, it, and and the knowledge of education. So we think if they can integrate that into the into the school curriculum, so people learn about HIV when they're in school, I think that can also change the the, 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 the stigma. So this year there was a there was something um, I, I marked for for integrating HIV curriculum or building a curriculum for HIV and integrating it into high schools and and, and, and colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And um, we have a very engaged audience today. So we have another audience question again from Manon. She is intrigued about your cast transfer program. She says, I'm glad to hear about the success story you shared. How many people do you reach with this program? And can we help from abroad with direct donations? Yeah, so um, this program currently we have for the first six months we enrolled about 450 patients on average that that we have a criteria like if you have a low bmi a high a high viral load a low a low cd4 count and you're you're newly diagnosed or your ch your child your pregnant woman you are enrolled in this program and like um and we're having a lot of successes like this is just one story the lot of the stories exist a lot of women especially the women they're using the, the cash transfer to start a business there's a woman that started selling some food stuff and so so like there's a lot of the stories and the thing why we started with 450 patients is because of the resources and we're seeking donation and we're trying to and expand this program to all our HIV patients in Kono. We have about um, more than a thousand HIV patients enrolled and taking treatment in Kono. And like we want to reach all of them. But for now, we're actually our community health workers are reaching over a thousand uh, uh, HIV patients. But like for this program, we are only enrolled 450 patients in Kono. Okay. Okay. And Byler, do you believe that? Sierra Leone's healthcare system will continue to evolve and create change. And, you know, let's talk about the next steps for global body clinic, because although you've come a very long way, you do say that there's more to do. So what does that look like? So I am an optimist, and I believe that uh, uh, definitely the healthcare system in Sierra Leone will, will, will change, and we are, we are on that way, and we're 
Like actually, I like partners in health uh, po uh, policy or whatever, starting with one or two districts and working deep dive, working in a comprehensive uh, uh, program and like uh, developing the Connor, the Connor district, Kwedu government hospital. We've developed it like it was the worst hospital in the country when part before partners in health started working in Sierra Leone. And now in, in five years, it's the best hospital in the country. And like we even now have receiving referrals from from Sierra Leone to, from Freetown, the capital city to Kono and around the world, around the country. And um, I also envision well body as a, as, as, a, as, a, as a clinic of central excellence because like uh, well body now is receiving students that are doing um, um, the uh, community medical officers from board that they're sending students to come and do their rotation at, at well body clinic and that's the vision for people to come and learn what we're doing and see what we're doing so they go back and then implement that in other parts of the in other parts of the country and like i think um also at pgh we're also receiving all and so the thing we also now expanding we're now expanding into the primary healthcare because mm -hmm. like part, part of the health model is community-based primary healthcare secondary healthcare that the community the the clinic clinics and the hospitals and now we're moving into four community care clinics that are that are treating HIV TB patients in the in the in the community and doing maternal and child health and and like we're, we're developing those clinics by putting the staff stuff space system as Paul Fama would say and and, and 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 space into those like where you need to build to build something where you need to put staff add staff to, to work adequately we put them there where we need to give to supplement the, the the government supply we give we get to complement the government supply we, we, we will support that and like and like um, I, I envision Connor to look like in the next 10 years to be like in all primary health in all the CHC community health care centers we are working there and those clean community care centers will be operating like well body functional and working very very effectively and having a proper referral system to the government hospital that we've developed greatly and then right in port the, and now that's why i've changed my my research focus now is mostly in health systems and i want to like do, do, do research that can inform policy change that will change policy in terms of health system and that's so that they can be replicated across the across the country and if we have like five six districts doing the same thing i know the healthcare system will definitely would, would be like it will be a big to change the healthcare system mm -hmm. Yeah, I really hope to see this in, in more places because it sounds like what you've started, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of resources, but it takes the know-how and, and you've managed to do that in, in not a long time. So, you know, generally from what I'm gathering from our conversation, I feel like what you guys are doing well is making people feel empowered to act and bring about change in their on their own terms you know, in order to bring about sustainable prevention and treatment aids in their own lives. And so your programs like better education and uh, cash transfers and give, giving them that economic stability, uh, it makes them more likely to protect themselves from, from contracting HIV, as well as choosing safer life strategies for themselves and for their families. So I, I'm very inspired by all of this. I encourage people to keep asking questions and Byler can get to them after the show, but we are nearing the end. And so I'll end by saying that, as I said in the beginning, it is evident that progress is made possible by improved access to health services, prevention programs, and as well as public awareness and education, because it really helps patients advocate for their interests and you know help shape their own destinies. So as we wrap up our time together, Byler, I'd like to thank you very much for being part of this discussion and for sharing your story with us and telling us about your tireless devotion to improving lives in your country. Thank you. It was very great to have you here. And I'm sure it was very educational for all of our viewers as well. You are very much an inspiration. And so thank you as well to our viewers for joining us. We welcome you to subscribe to QBI TV while you're here so that we can See you next time as we continue to talk about the evolution and progress with HIV research and care. All right, thank so you thank so you. Much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, God.